Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13 as we uh, finish our thoughts on facing giants. Tradition says that um, the fear of Fridays in general uh, once kept sailors, uh, British sailors, from leaving port on Fridays. Um, story goes that the British Navy wanted to attack this fear a long time ago, so they uh, formed, they laid the keel of a new ship on a Friday, named her the HMS Friday, launched her on Friday the 13th, and her captain was James Friday, <laughs> and he never returned. <laughs> that was a made-up story. I, I, and, it, and it's fitting, um, I was working on this message and uh, reviewing it, and I thought, oh, uh, I saw this little blurb in a sermon. And uh, it's so fitting that the illustration uh, was just factual, and then I looked it up, and it was all made up. All right, and so uh, that's why I try to I try to validate my uh, my illustrations because uh, whoever used it as an illustration in a sermon forgot to uh, research it and realized that it was all just made up. But we're looking at Numbers chapter 13, and at the end of this, we we reference this uh, when we started out talking about facing giants. And so we're closing with this idea because we know what happened at the beginning. At the beginning, Moses sends, uh, sends out the 12 spies. At the end in verse 30, it says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the, and eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Tonight, we close with the idea of facing the giant of impossibility. One pastor said, it's not so much what life brings to us in our hands as what we bring to life in our spirit. It sometimes makes the difference. And I'm not just saying that it's uh, the power of positive thinking, but here we have it illustrated. That statement is illustrated in the story of the 12 spies. Here, the 12 spies explored the promised land. Their purpose in spying was not to determine if the land could be taken. That was supposedly already decided. It was decided by God because that was their inheritance. It was determined how best to accomplish that task. And they found the land to be exceedingly good land, flowing with milk and honey. Also, they saw the giants, the son of Anak. But Caleb and Joshua saw these giants in the light of God, and therefore um, they were in no sense terrified by them. They were represented only in opportunity. They, uh, in, in fact, in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 9, it says, um, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, they spake unto the company, and then in verse 9 it says, Only rebel not, not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Look at what he says. You know what? These guys, this is our lunch. Do you see what he says? Here's Joshua. He says in verse 9, look at He says, For they are bread for us. You know what? We'll eat their lunch. That's what we'll do. That's why I like the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb present to us that we can face the giant of impossibility. And as you come up to life, this is what's going to happen. You're going to face things that seem impossible. 
And it's not just a, a Goliath that is out there. Sometimes there's a Goliath, and, uh, and in some sense, uh, we talked about it this in regards to the giants. A Goliath is out there. It's the Philistines, and, it's, and he's out there mo uh, mocking our Savior, and he's, he's uh, basically desecrating our God. And sometimes, though, it's a land that's out there, and God has told you to go and possess the land and the giants that are in the land, and sometimes it's our fear. Sometimes it's just fear of the unknown. I was reading that, and, uh, you know, there are 700 fears that you can look up. Some of them, it's just fearful to um, see the, the vocabulary. I mean, I, I, some of the, some of the uh, vocabulary of the word, I, I'm, I'm fearful of looking at it. It scared me, and I have no idea what it meant. All right? In fact, if you look up fear of failure, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's like a 13-letter a vocabulary word or whatever. I mean, they're huge. I mean, just that would make me want to quit, All right? especially in a spelling bee. <laughs> but the two fears that are at the top is fear of death, and they call that uh, necrophobia, and then fear of failure. I can't even spell fear of failure. All right, it was, it was just, I was like, ah, forget that. <laughs> I'll fail, all right? I just gave in to the fear. But fear of death and fear of failure. And I think that that's some of it when we're faced with something impossible, the failure just kind of creeps up and it can strangle you. And that's what we're going to look at as we close with this idea this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for, Lord, this time that we could look at different giants. We've looked at a lot of them. There are a lot of things that come in. Last week, we looked at the idea of fear of witnessing and how that giant of fear can just shut us down, and we can come up with all kinds of excuses. Looked at the fear of, or the, the giant of bitterness and discouragement, giant of temptation and sin, lots of different giants, Lord. This morning we looked at the giant of greed. Lord, sometimes I can't describe them all. Sometimes they're just an impossible situation. Lord, I pray that this passage would teach us that we can come to a God that delights to do the impossible. And I pray that we trust in you. As always, Lord, do that which I can't and speak to hearts. We ask for your power and claim that in Jesus' name. Amen. So two points this evening. First, you'll see that the men here in Numbers chapter 13, you look at verse 17, it says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Get you up this way southward. Go up into the mountains. See the land, what it is. All right, and he tells them uh, that uh, see, see what the people are like, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, whether the land is that they, uh, that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. Notice what he's saying. Hey, I just want you to scope it out because we're taking it. He didn't tell them to go spy it out uh, so that, we, uh, so that we can, you can come back and discourage us and say that there's giants in the land and we're not supposed to do it. He's saying just scope it out because God's given us the land. And so they went up, searched the land. That's in verse 21. And then in verse 26, they went and came to Moses and to Aaron. And in verse 27, they tell him that, hey, there are good things. The the. It's flowing with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it, and they showed him it. And then in verse 28, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. That's the first time they bring up this idea of the children of Anak. And so in this, you see some um, ideas that come out. First of all, then, if we're going to face the giant of impossibility, stop seeing the problems of life. Some of you, and I'm not saying that you just float through life and you never see a problem, but some of you, that's the first thing you do. Whenever anybody's ever excited about somebody being saved, did they really? Shut up, all right? Just let me be nice. 
Let me be nice to you and just tell you to shut up. I, I'm, I'm glad that somebody's happy when someone gets saved. I'm glad that somebody's, oh, you had a good offering? I bet you next week's going to be bad. <laughs> it's just we seem to dwell in that. We seem to just uh, love the idea of negativity. And this attitude shows up all the time. For example, a person who is considering accepting Christ as Savior, they reject him. Why? I can't live a godly life. Have you ever heard that? What are they doing? They're looking way down at a problem. Wait a minute. Can't Christ change you? Can't, can't Christ do that? But no, instead they jump down the road. Well, I can't do that because I don't know that um, I can live a godly life. Well, wait a minute. Maybe Christ can change you. A person looking at Christian stewardship. This happens to all of us as we're looking at uh, tithing, as we're looking at giving and what God wants us to do. Sometimes we say, well, if I tithe, I can't pay my bills. All right? it's, it's looking at the problems again. A student who is getting serious about Christian commitment sees maybe, maybe it's a student in, in school, it's maybe a young person, uh, maybe it's a, one of the kids that are coming in on TNT or so, uh, off the bus routes and they're growing, and then all of a sudden at home it starts a little bit and then it grows a little bit at, at school, and then all of a sudden as they're maybe trying to be more committed, they say, well, I don't know if I can handle the ridicule. It's looking at the problems again. Can God help us? A person who thinks about witnessing what comes up. We talked about that last week. It's fear. We automatically jump down to the problem. And in this passage, you see what looking at the problems can do for you. Look at three things in our passage. Look at 1328. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Negativity, so I'm going to use the term negativity, all right? Negativity will sidetrack God's purpose. That's what it'll do. You know what negativity will do in your life? You're supposed to go witness, it'll sidetrack you because you're supposed to go witness. Negativity will sidetrack you from being involved in the ministry God wants you to be in. Some of you say, you know what, I don't know that I, can, I could be in a nursing home. I don't know that I could be in a Sunday school class. I don't know that I could go out and do this or that. And God wants you to do something. God is pushing you saying, hey, serve me, serve me, serve me. And you say, wait a minute, I can't speak. Wait a minute, I can't do, do this. Negativity will sidetrack you in God's purpose. Because that's what happened with these ten, the ten men. The ten men, all they saw was the negativity. All they saw was it's not possible. And what was God's purpose? To go into that land. And instead, and this is what happens to folks, they dwell in that negativity. And what do you know about them? Those ten men... Later in Numbers chapter 14, God was so angry, said, their carcasses will die in the wilderness. They never saw it. They never saw God's purpose. Be careful of living in that negative world because you may just end up wandering around in the wilderness and you'll die very unhappy. Negativity will sidetrack you from God's purpose. Notice in verse 29, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebutites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Well, you guys did your research. Look at verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land. Okay? Uh, and they brought up, an, uh, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Okay, then you go down in verse 33, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. You know what negativity will do? Negativity will sidetrack you from God's purpose. Negativity will start you into the world of exaggeration. You're a grasshopper? 
And it, did you notice? In our sight. Okay, let, let me see you hop. I mean, exaggeration? Hello? You're a grasshopper now. I don't care if the guy was 10 foot tall, right, you're still six foot. Right, the last I checked, right, I'm 5'9", and a grasshopper's pretty small. Even if that, I'm still a whole lot bigger than a grasshopper. I mean, I'm like monstrous. And even if a guy was 10 foot, I mean, it's not the same comparison. And that's what will happen to you. You get all exaggerated. Oh, you don't understand. What does the Bible say? There's a lion in the street. Oh, really? A lion? But that's what happens to you and I. Oh, you don't know a giant of imposter. Oh, you don't know my husband. Really? Well, I guess I don't know you. All right, either. All right, we all can live in that world. You don't know my wife. You don't know my family. Oh, stop exaggerating. And just making it so much bigger than, oh, it's so impossible. Stop whining. Because that's what you're doing. You're whining and whining and whining. And negativity will start you down the road of exaggeration. And so then you just have to build it bigger and bigger. Why, why do you have to build it so big? Because you have to justify your cowardice. That's what you have to do. You have to justify your cowardice. You have to justify that you don't have enough faith to trust God with the impossible situation. Negativity will start you into exaggeration. Notice in verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. I'm glad they said that. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Another phrase in there. Remember, the Bible always can teach us things just from its own words. So negativity, stop, stop seeing all the problems in life. Amen. I understand that we have to deal with problems, but just deal with it. Deal with the problems. But the negativity that comes, guess what it's going to do? It's going to sidetrack you from God's purpose. It's going to start you into exaggeration, and it's going to set your sights on self. Did you notice? It's in our sight. I don't really care what you think or what you see sometimes because you know what? God sees differently. And as soon as you take your sights off of God and put it on self, you know what's going to start happening? You are going to be in an impossible situation. You never will be able to face it. Why? Because... Your sights are on self. When your sight is on self, you will always be disappointed. Why? Well, because self, it lets you down. Self, it'll discourage you. Self, it'll, 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 promise, it'll promise all this and leave you empty. That's what self does. There's a story, and we've used it before, it's, it's said that a wild duck on migration came into a barnyard. And he liked it so well that he stayed. In, his in the fall, his companions passed overhead. His first impulse was to rise and join them. But he had eaten too well. And he could rise no higher than the eaves of the barn. The day came when his old fellow travelers could pass overhead without even that duck hearing the call. And too often, we're similar in our situation. We're meant to do a lot more, but you get satisfied with being in the barnyard, pecking on the ground, when God has a lot more for us. And what happens? Here's num it's an example here in Numbers 13. In Numbers 13, you see some men that were told to go out and to spy out. And guess what happened? 
They let negativity take over. So stop seeing the problems of life. And then secondly, start seeing the possibilities. What do we see in this passage? Well, an acceptance you see with uh, Caleb and Joshua, you see both of them, that they, Joshua comes to them and they, um, they, they search the land, they rent their clothes and they spake unto all the company of, this is 14 and verse 6 and 7, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land. Right? But they, they also are referring back to some things, and this is what, if you're going to accept the possibilities, if you're going to see the possibilities of life, there's three things that come out. It's an acceptance of God's providence. It's an acceptance of God's purpose. And it may be hard. It may seem impossible. It may seem like it, this, there is no way, and this can seem uh, that way in our lifetime. And it can seem that way maybe with a relative. It can seem that way with what we're trying to do as far as rearing our children. And you would say, man, it seems impossible sometimes. But is it God's purpose? Then trust him. Then trust him. If God has a purpose and if God is in control, we can trust him. And if it comes down to it, all right, if I'm doing his will and he takes me out of this life, then fine. Then I'm still doing his will. I'm still enjoying doing his will. But I won't enjoy doing, uh, I won't enjoy living when I get so discouraged and I get filled up with negativity and I just say, forget it. Then, guess what? I'm going to be sad at his appearing. I'm going to be sad when I face the judgment seat of Christ because I will answer for what I do, and so will you. We will answer for it. So I need to have an acceptance of God's providence, of his purpose. On the border of Kingston, Ontario, Canada, there's a fort there <laughs> with guns pointing the wrong way. The story is that two forts were designed in England at the same time. One fort was for Kingston, Jamaica, and the other one was for Kingston, Canada. When they sent the plans, they switched them. And whoever was building the fort in Canada wasn't thinking straight, and they're like, well, the plans say to put the guns that way. We're not supposed to think. And so guess what? With no, and this is what I'm saying, with no sense of mission and with not, with, without understanding a purpose, we get lost. And here's a fort that the guns are basically, oh, you, can, you could have them ablazing, shooting nothing. What are you protecting there? I don't know. I don't know. Well, we got to stand here and man them. God doesn't want you living that way. God's given me purpose and he's given you purpose. Why? Because he has a perfect will for you. Then find that will. Understand that in his providence, he will guide you in that will. And that gives you meaning in this life. It's just like Joshua and Caleb. What did Caleb say? Caleb, even, this is what I love about Caleb and Joshua, because even though what happened, the ten spies ruined it for them. What, what's going to happen now? they got to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and what does Caleb step up and say? Uh-uh, wait. I'm not. You know what? God's promised me. Because I have purpose, and it's in his providence that I go into that land. And when we get over there, what do I want? I want that mountain. That's what he said. Why? Because when you have purpose and when you understand God's providence, even when there's an impossible situation, like wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, that's a little sidetrack. That's so, oh, come on, you idiots. But guess what? He had to endure it too. 
He did. But he took it in stride. Why? Because he understands God's providence and his purpose. That's number one. We're looking at the possibilities. Number two, and it's, a, it's, it's an assurance of God's power. So an acceptance of God's providence, an assurance of God's power. You see that right in the phrase in verse 8, then he will bring us into the land. Who will do it? He will. It's an assurance of God's power. This is what the ten spies forgot. The ten spies said, nevertheless, we be not strong enough. Welcome to the club. Because I'm not either, and neither are you. But he can bring us into the land. It's an assurance of God's power. You learn to rely on God, and you learn to trust in him, and you have faith in God's will and in God's work and in God's word. You can do it his way, and you'll see victory. You'll be able to face an impossibility. That's what this passage is teaching us. The ten unfaithful uh, spies saw themselves as grasshoppers. They considered themselves insignificant. But Caleb and Joshua did not agree. We say, we are well able to overcome. Did you see that in our passage? It said in verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people and said, for we are well able to overcome it. And was he saying it in his confidence, in his might? No, you go later on and it's because he's there. It's not anything that we're mighty and we're great. If, if you're involved in the ministries here, and you should be in some regards, and you're, and you're trying to lead people to the Lord or bring people to church or we're trying to disciple people, and, and you all of a sudden think that it's in you, man, you're going to flop. But if, if we can tap in to what God has given us, and that's his power, then you know what? It doesn't matter what this world throws against us. It doesn't matter what Satan throws against us. That's the beauty of the church. Remember, even Jesus said that. He said in Matthew, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Man, a unified church and a powerful church, Satan can't touch it. We can go forth like a mighty army. And so we see an assurance of God's power. Then the last thing I think we see is a reliance on God's provision. Notice what it says in uh, 14, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. God's provision is here. The Lord, I, I, again, I said that at the beginning, Joshua here is... And Caleb, I don't think they're so confident in themselves. Look at, look at down, and, and this is how I know it's not in them. Look at uh, later in the passage, look at verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he hath another spirit with him, and hath followed me, how? Fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1. And we see Caleb, and I think Joshua, we see that in Joshua chapter 1, and you also see it in Deuteronomy 28, but these two verses are specific with Caleb. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 1 and verse 36. It says, um, look at verse 35, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, notice, because he hath, what, wholly followed the Lord. You know, it's not so difficult, is it? 
It's not so complicated. Oh, man, I mean, what secret? I mean, what's the recipe here? I mean, how come they were blessed? Because they followed the Lord. This morning, I know Ryan was given a testimony he was talking about. And sometimes I think we want it so complex, so difficult. But we have it right here, the Bible. And the Word of God can help you. Every situation. You say, man, I, I, I'm not sure. You can go to the Word of God. You can trust it. The Word of God can help you. You notice then in our text a couple of things then. Negativity sidetracks you. Negativity starts you into exaggeration. Negativity focuses you, focuses you and your sight on self. But if you're going to face the impossible and start seeing the possible that God can do, you're going to accept God's providence, you're going to have an assurance of God's power, and you're going to rely on God's provision, and God will give you victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Second Corinthians chapter 12, it says, and remember Paul is, is coming to the Lord, and he has that thorn in the flesh. In verse 7 he says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that were given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger, notice what he says, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So I guess he should have quit. He should have been overcome with negativity. He could have exaggerated. He could have, he could have just uh, focused on himself. But instead, notice what happens in verse 9. And God came to him and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, sometimes an impossibility comes into your life so that you can see that you're not all you think you are. And yet God is all he says he is. That's our God. That's our Savior read of a couple of guys it was actually this past fall the one one guy's name is Fuad Baka of Algeria he finished a 1500 meter race in three minutes and 49.59 seconds in a stadium in Rio de Janeiro it's so fast and this was this past fall. That is so fast that if Baca had finished that time in that exact stadium in August, he would have beat out the U.S. for the Olympic gold medal. But Fuad Baca finished fourth. He finished fourth. He was racing in the Paralympics. Three other racers finished ahead of him. He was racing in a race for the visually impaired. I guess they didn't know that they weren't supposed to run that fast. <laughs> Two other, three other men, one of them his brother, his brother took the bronze. Two other men took the gold and the silver. Now think about it. I mean, wait a minute. You're, you're not supposed to be able to do that. I think that's a great illustration for you and I. Because some of you say, I can't witness. I can't live a Christian life. I can't tithe. 
I can't do this, I can't do that. And you know what? God says, wait a minute, my grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient. And maybe we should say, I will rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ can rest upon us. May that be the prayer of our church. I'd rather have a church that basically the world would consider an infirmary, a bunch of misfits, a bunch of folks that say, oh, you know what, they can't accomplish anything. No, we can't. But God can. And with God's help, we can have good families. We can see folks saved. We can see people reached. We can see a church that is thriving. How can we see that? Not in us. No. We look past the problems because problems will be here. They'll be in the past. They'll be in the present. And just so you know, they'll be in the future. Problems will be there. But God can take that problem and make a possibility. That's what he can do. That's our God. Heads bowed, eyes closed this evening. God may have dealt with your heart in some area. I'm glad that we were able to look at many of these giants. And I'm glad that God helped us look at them and see that we can accomplish some things with God's help. And may God help us as individuals and as families and as a church to look past our infirmities and see a, the God of the impossible and trust him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for the word of God that can teach us and instruct us. I pray that you would lead and guide us. Bless the invitation, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Standing with heads bowed, eyes closed. God, may be dealt in your heart. You come as the piano and organ play.